This is going to be a great day. This is going to be a great week. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says this, God's speaking to us and he says, do not be afraid for anything for I'm with you. Don't be afraid for I'm your God. I will help you. I will strengthen you. Let's just ask the Lord for that help right now. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus so that he could be on assignment and give us the precious Holy Spirit. So we have a helper, a comforter right here with us, the advocate, the standby with us, helping us right now unfold these words, this scripture, so that we might have insight and revelation for all the benefits and blessings that you have for us in this time in history. In the name of Jesus, amen. We're on life part three, and we're going to zone in on this identity of love. It's all about life. Have you ever been tricked by a fraud God? Are you bound to a lie that's pulling you under? Do you blame others for what's wrong in your life? This is for you. God is for you. Did you know love is for you? Jesus said this in John 10, 10. He said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's what God has for us. Abundant life. Get this down on the inside of your heart. If you're, if you're interested in abundant, overflowing life, you need to know the source, the supplier of that life. Not only that, you need to know what it is. Otherwise, you get conned and you end up rejecting the very thing that you want, life. It's so easy to think something counterfeit is real. Is it possible that maybe you have believed a lie? Shaq O'Neal told his children this. He said, we ain't rich. He said, I'm rich. <laughs> he later qualified that statement by saying that his number one rule for his kids is education. He believes that that will set them up for life. Ah, but... In today's postmodernist environment, we have a lot of bitter, confused, and even disturbed instructors. They bend curriculum to pull your kids away from truth and principle into some kind of social activism. They end up questioning the outcome of even two plus two in the name of justice and inclusion. It distorts life when you forsake reality, science, and even faith for a new cult of social correctness. Albert Einstein said this one time. He said, politics is for the present, but an equation is for eternity. We all need correction, not confirmation. True love corrects what's wrong. It doesn't affirm evil. Jesus called the devil the father of lies. A lie is the antithesis of truth, light, and love. There was an old country song that said something like this. He said, I searched the world over and thought I found true love. You bet another and pfft, you were gone. <laughs> Thinking you found love and truly knowing love. Look, they're not the same thing. It's lies versus life. True love is not anti-discernment or putting your head in the sand. You can't substitute a designer version of love for the reality of love. That's just living a lie. People who fall for that often end up hurting other people just to get payback for their hurts. You don't want to live like that because that's not life. We've already learned that Jesus is the truth and he is the light. Now God's word is going to show us this in part three of life, that he is love. So let's just review for a second here. Let me bring you up to date. In the first two parts of this series called Life, we zeroed in on the identity of truth and the identity of light, essential to life. In the first parts, we heard the true story of a precious young woman living on the streets, working for a drug habit. A few older Christian ladies prayed with her, and she was miraculously delivered from addictions. But then in her sober state, realized how destroyed and wrecked her life was. She was free from the addiction, but she needed to be filled with life. When she received Jesus, she received truth, light, and what we're about to focus in on in this segment, love. That young woman wasn't truly ready for life until she was filled with love. So let's explore this facet of life, part three, and talk about the identity of love because love ain't a thing. No, no, true love is a person. 
I've seen, you know, we all seen these posters that come up about love. And I saw this poster one time that said, love is telling someone that his zipper is open or her, her wig looks too fake. I don't know about you, but I, I kind of have higher expectations for love. So I've got good news for you today. Good news. First John 4 verse 8. Listen to this. God is love. God doesn't just love, but he is love. Some marriage counselors, I've heard them say that love is a decision. And to a point, I agree. God says that what you believe is your choice and your choices are the sum of your life. Do you choose God? Then your choice is for truth, light, and yes, love. Well, what is love? I once read that love is when a husband protects his wife from the desire to get bangs, <laughs> which might be true. I remember one time when Pam and I were courting, when we were dating, she was watching these Audrey Hepburn movies and I, I showed up to pick her up and she walked out and she had these little pixie bangs that she had cut herself and, and I didn't know that. And I was like, oh dear. I said, Pam, what, what happened to your hair? She was like, oh, you, you, you don't like it? It was kind of a funny exchange. But yes, husbands, you have to protect your wives from bangs. That could be love. What is love? You know, the, the Bible, the first mention of love in the Bible is when Abraham expresses his love for his son Isaac. That's Genesis 22, verse 2. Love is the ultimate context to life. It's the ultimate context to live in. Love is the family identity and the address. Like truth and light, love is God's identity and love is powerful, life-altering, unfailing, eternal. We've allowed society, even contemporary Christian culture, to damage and demote the worldview of true love. It's not a feeling. It's not a phase. and It's not an experience. This is why too many people are bound by fear and torment. The problem with a forgery kind of love is you cannot build a life with such a corrupt building material. Every decision, every choice is wrong because the material is fake. You wake up one day blaming love for this crazy, weak building you call life, but you chose to use toxic materials, a counterfeit kind of love. But today's a new day. Say that out loud. Say, today is a new day that the Lord has made, and I'm choosing God's love. So let me help you do that. The Hebrew meaning for the word love, the word picture that we get for love in the Hebrew is this. It's an open door to the strength or the origin of the house, the family identity. It's an open door to the father's heart. It's inside access to all the benefits and blessings of the father's heart. That's love. But that makes no sense if you've brought into this cultural broke version of love. Entertainment's rewrite on love. Even religion's self-sacrificing fraud god idea of love. That's broke. The world sells us on a forgery of love that is all about consuming, give me, feed me, affirm me, prop me up. I demand my benefits. Take, take. God says love, true love, gives. So the basis of life here is God is love. His identity is love. Yes, he loves. In fact, John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we reconcile that with 1 John 4, verse 8 that says, God is love. So, so basically we can say love so loved the world that love gave. And the verse before that says, love is from God and anyone who loves is born of God. Life is constructed of God's truth, his light, and yes, love. If you're missing these powerful, essential building blocks, your house, your life, so to speak, will crumble into the ground every time. Well, why, Pastor Stephen, why don't I feel accepted well, why, why do I struggle with my self-worth, my value? You see, it's a life issue directly cor correlated to what's in your heart. If you're truth illiterate, then you're love illiterate. Do you really think the secular world knows love? Most of the time, they don't even know the difference between a boy and a girl, a man or a woman. Why have we come to this place in history? Illiteracy, Bible illiteracy, love illiteracy 
illiteracy. Instead, we have subjective morality. That's what we've substituted it with. That means morality decided by the individual or a feeling or a preference basis. Do you wonder why your choices are working against you? How can you know love if you refuse the truth? You're love illiterate. Tim Allen, you know, the guy that played in the Santa Claus movies, he's the comedian, the actor. He once said, a guy knows he's in love when he loses interest in his car for a couple of days. <laughs> I know a few guys like that. Tina Turner, the iconic singer from the 80s, she used to sing this famous song that said, what's love but a secondhand emotion? Now, I'm not sure about you, but I don't think I'm excited about any of those versions of love. 1 Corinthians 13, on the other hand, says this, love is patient, kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud. You see, love is about the outcome. Life is all about the outcome. Jesus gave parable after parable to show us how our choices would lead to what? An outcome. People can err in two different ways with Jesus. Either they get offended with what he says, or they just rewrite a new version of Jesus, a custom model that's no longer aligned to God's word, but perfectly in sync with their designer morality. It's a hybrid Christianity that doesn't need the Bible, but still kind of likes Jesus, right? And notice how their kids want nothing to do with their brand of religion. Do you know why? Because their kids watch them at home and they know their parents' weekend Christianity does nothing for them all week long, nothing for the home. If there's anything the next generation detests, it's a fraud, promise with no outcome, love talk, but no love walk. Truth illiteracy equals love stupidity. So let's make it real simple, really simple. Love is kind of like water. Sometimes an analogy can help us better understand the unseen, the ethereal. Love is a little like water. It's everywhere and it's absolutely necessary for life. It's not just all around us, it's inside of us. Did you know that water makes up 70% of the human body and for kids it's even higher? Water can take any and every shape. It can be solid ice that a transport truck drives on. It can be a refreshing, life-saving drink. It's steaming gas that powers a mighty engine. It falls from the sky as rain, snow, ice, and then it evaporates back into the atmosphere only to bring life to the world again. And love is a lot like water, but even far more essential. Now look, a picture is worth a thousand words, so let's try this. This is kind of like your life. You're a vessel, the Bible says. You're, you're this container that needs to be full of love, needs to be full of life. And a lot of people experience, we all do, we experience the trials of life. And when you have the heat of life, and because don't forget, life has motion, life has movement, so it's got friction. And when your life is just filled with this one, like hot air, it's just gonna, this is what happens to all of us without that love filling. But this on the other case, this on the other hand is a life, it's a vessel and look, it's filled. I got it filled with water, which water represents the love. And look, the friction comes, the life comes, all the heat, all the adversity, perfect. How does that happen? What's the difference? It's the difference between a life being filled with authentic love and what we think, the idea of love. Without love, without true love, the trials and the heat of life are just too much to handle. You burn up, you blow up, you pop. Ignorance of what true love is distorts our understanding of what it does. Can I just say that again? Ignorance of what true love is distorts our understanding of what it does and therefore of who God is. Love is powerful. It's life-giving hydration. It's essential. It's everywhere. And yet, if it's not in you, you will die. You're going to pop, blow up. Love, like a mighty ocean wave, can evict all fear from the shores of your mind and your thinking. Aren't you glad about that? Love, like water, can be soft, can be hard as steel, a drop or an ocean, deep or shallow, above you and beneath you. Ephesians 3, verses 17 and 19. I love this. Listen. May Christ, through your faith, actually dwell, make his permanent home in your hearts, 
May you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love, that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of it, that you may really come to know the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge, that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God and become a body holy, filled and flooded with God himself. Doesn't that just make you think of our balloon? Filled with water, able to easily handle the heat and agitation of life, the movements of life, the friction of life. Did you know this? This is all about being rooted securely in love with power, strength, and the full knowledge of God flooding you with himself. But you have to know the love of Christ. God's love is unfailing. It's perfect, patient, kind, and the essence of your true identity. Fake it and you'll never make it. You'll never have it. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 tells us these thing, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is, guess what? Love. But you've got to have it. When astronomers look for life on other planets, what do you think they look for? Water. When life is measured on earth, what kind of unit would God measure it in? Love the real stuff that is born of him and has the power to destroy and cast out all fear. Listen to 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist, but full-grown, complete, perfect love turns out fear out of the doors and expels every trace of terror. For fear brings with it the thought of punishment. And so he who is afraid has not reached the full maturity of love is not yet grown into love's complete perfection. You see, love that has no power over fear is not real. Your maturity is measured by how much love you have in the tank. Never let your heart be condemned now when you're afraid. Don't don't get condemned. Just recognize that your gauge is saying you've got more room for God's love. So be happy. Be glad to realize that, to know that. Some think that they have a fear problem. No, you have a heart vacancy waiting for love. For a moment now, let's talk about why life is such a mystery for so many. Generally speaking, we are extremely Bible illiterate. A majority of people in North America identify as Christians, and yet they're extremely Bible illiterate. They can't even remember the last time they seriously read the Bible. And I'm not saying that to be critical. I'm bringing it to your attention to ask these questions. If we so desperately need answers, why have we resigned from the life book of answers? Why is that? Do we think it's virtuous to die slow and painfully? Do we have this obsession with living empty? A belief that being illiterate of the truth is advantageous because life is just too much or too hot or too hard or too too difficult to understand. If that's so, that that's just, a, we're believing a lie if that's what we're believing. It's deceit. Remember our balloon without water? Then think of our balloon with water. We need God's love. Activity in a ministry organization is not the same thing as knowing God or his word. Volunteering, yes, even for a church building, is not a substitute for knowing God's word. And therefore, it's not a replacement for life. True L-I-F-E. Many amazing people get confused in the work and sacrifice of their volunteerism only to wake up one day and realize what they really needed was God's love all along. They were busy serving but not paying attention. God said he has no pleasure in our sacrifice, hmm? but he wants us to what? Obey. So what's that look like? Because you can't obey what you don't know. If you're truth illiterate, and instead looking for a quick soul fix or something to do or maybe just a feel-good experience, all you're doing is chasing religious rainbows and unicorns while avoiding the critical thing that will build your life. God's Word, His love, His life. It's the religion of avoidance. Look the other way. There's nothing to see here, but you're losing out on true life and love. Decide right now that you're done. You're done not knowing. Say it, I'm done with all that. Jesus came to give me life, say that, so I can have life more abundantly. Good for you. Now keep on saying that. 
And this is why I tell you to keep on saying it because there are so many mental strategies in this world that are anti-life. This is why it's so hard for many people. I have great compassion for those who are lost. Jesus came to save, not condemn. He does that by leading us to a, a place of conviction because if you don't know what's wrong, why would you ever ask for help or direction or correction, right? If you're driving down the road and blissfully sure that you're going the right way, you don't ask for help. You don't pursue course correction. Even when you're headed off a cliff, you think you're going the right way. That's the illusion today. Society wants to lower the bar so everyone just feels good, feels deserving, a sense of equity, even though it's, it destines them for a life of failure. Why are we such a mess? Could it be that we're really wrong? that we really are life illiterate, ignorant of what true love is or who true love is? Hey, that's my story. I had to come to God and say, God, I'm wrong. I've sinned. Please save me. I need Jesus. I, I don't know what to do. Jesus said, Stephen, I'm happy to save you, but you need to learn to walk in the truth if you want a good life. You need to learn to read my word and get to know me. Study it, memorize my word, and you'll know what true love is. You know what? God was right. Just imagine that. <laughs> do you really, really want to know true love? I mean, love like you've never imagined. Jesus prayed this as he's about to go to the cross and suffer for all of us in the name of love. John 17, verse 26, Jesus said, I will continue to make you known, talking about the Father, that the love which you have bestowed upon me may be in them, felt in their hearts, and that I myself may be in them. Praise God. Jesus actually prayed for you that the same love God bestows on Jesus may be in you, felt by you, realized by you. That is amazing. Jesus wants you to have so much love that it's just as Father God lavishing his love on his son, except in this case, it's his child, you, in Christ Jesus. So I have to ask it again. Why are we feeling so rejected, unworthy, so unloved? Is it because we don't deserve God's love? None of us deserve God's love. If you knew the truth of God's word, you'd know that no one is righteous. No one deserves his love. That's why God sent Jesus, that we might get a love transfer of his righteousness into us by his grace through faith in him. The short answer, you get what Jesus deserves. That's ridiculous. It's immeasurable love, the love of God. You get what Jesus deserves. Praise God. So let's land this right now by talking about how to live life in love. That's called living life strong. In part two, we looked at four basic applications to work truth and light for the outcome of life. I've got a feeling, I've just got a feeling, those same directives work for love. Number one, obey. That's what Jesus did every step he took on earth. And he's the king of kings, so surely we can understand that to obey is to activate love. Number two, we talked about praise. Praise is an amplifier. What we need in this world is more love, so praise is key. Psalm 21 verse 13 actually says this, we will sing and praise your power. Love is his power, his identity. And then number three, attend. This addresses the love illiteracy de deficit that we have. Attend what? His word, his love. And then number four, imitate. We get to imitate love. Jesus is the word, he's light, and he is love. We have his example. That's why he told his disciples, love one another. Just as I've loved you, we get to imitate love. Look here. These four applications work the identity of love. Obey, praise, attend, and imitate. If you're singing about love in some building with a cross on it, but not living out love in the family Jesus died for, then you're truth illiterate. Don't get mad at you. Just repent. Get right and walk in love right now. Let the person of truth light and love inside you right now. Why wait? God doesn't want your penance. He wants your person. That's all of you. Love doesn't want your sacrifice, but your faith in his sacrifice. Truth doesn't want your promise, but you to trust in God's promise. Light doesn't need you to give power, but to give permission for God's power. And love doesn't demand, love supplies, love supplies, yes, love gives.
The bottom line is, this is all to have life. John 20, verse 31. But these are written, recorded in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the son of God, and that through believing and cleaving to and trusting and relying upon him, love, you may have life through in his name, through who he is. You see, God's word says through who he is, through his identity, whose identity, the son of God's. And it is said that these are written. What's written? God's truth, God's word. Why? So we can believe, cleave, trust, rely. That's our part. You can't choose right if you don't believe right. Let me say that again. You can't choose right if you don't believe right. Love illiteracy stops the transfer because you can't believe what you don't know. Your ignorance of God's truth stops the gift of God because you can't receive what you don't believe. How many different ways can I say this so that you understand ignorance is not an excuse. The light will not turn on just because you're in the dark. You must choose to ask, seek, and knock. That means pursue the truth or die in ignorance. Pastor Stephen, why are you being so blunt? Can't you just be more more like, I don't know, home renovation friendly? Okay, well, let's make it a little bit of a demo day here. Have you ever watched those experts on TV doing some of those home renovations? They violently demo a rehab project to get it to a place of being ready for rebirth, renewal. It's interesting how many homeowners are shocked that they have so much rot, termite damage, mold, asbestos, code violations, and the list goes on. When you're living in your mess, you become familiar with that mess, and so you become accepting of it, even though it's not working. The odd rat runs through your life. You get electrocuted when you touch certain appliances. The hot water rarely comes through the shower and everyone knows that toilet and that bathroom does not flush. You live with it and you just call it home. You're adjusted to the mess of anti-life, but it doesn't mean it's what God has for you, that it's his will. Just because you can't save yourself doesn't mean you're not worth saving. There's extreme power in true love, power for renovation. Ephesians 3.20 says this, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. What power do you think that is? You guessed it, love, God's love, which is his identity, which is the abundant life Jesus gives us. It's time for life, life for you. Let go of the past with the love that Jesus prayed for us. Love will empower you for life joy, blessing, hope, happiness. God cannot give you something that you don't permit. He said, you choose. So you must authorize this plan for your life. You activate it with your faith. You were born in this world heading for a destiny. Be intentional with God's gift of grace to steer for life. If you're paying attention at all, you're already seeing the warning signs of what's coming in here in this life. Wake up, my friend, wake up. Time is shorter than you think. Wake up to life in God's truth, light, and love. Every prophetic sign of God's word is ringing the bell right now with a warning for humanity to turn, to come to Jesus, to know the truth, to experience God's love. Jesus said in John 17, verse 17, your word is truth. In this world, there is a strange foreboding in the air like the quiet before a storm. There is complete safety in the name of the Lord, inside the identity of truth, light, and love. We cannot march and vote for death and then somehow believe the harvest won't have teeth. Life is not a lottery, my friend. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, that and that only is what you will reap. Embrace life, God's truth, God's light, and his love. Are you stuck Are you discouraged, maybe tormented by fear? You can become a receiver right now. Be that one who humbles himself and says, God, be gracious, merciful, help me, save me, bless me. That's a believer. See, receivers are believers. And when it's all said and done, there is no faking life. You either have it or you don't. Right now, it's your choice. Pray this with me and choose to be a believer. Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I need you to save me. Come into my heart. I believe in you. You died on the cross for me. Fill me with your love. Baptize me in your truth. Guide me with your light. 
In your name I pray, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.